Good. Let's start. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon to America. Good evening to Europe. Welcome to this webinar on e-mortar testing for aerospace <coughs> applications, which I'm personally very excited about. My name is Pascal Ernen, and I will be your moderator today, and I will guide you through this webinar. Please notice that today's webinar is recorded and that you're muted on purpose. The recording will be shared after this webinar with you. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. And we will answer all your questions at the end um, of the presentation today. And if you're running out of time, then we will come back to you via email for sure. And now let me introduce you today's speakers, Bill Swolinski our application specialist for aerospace <laughs> applications in test and measurement. Bill is working for Kistler for more than 20 years, and he has a math degree in electrical engineering, specializing in signal processing and controls. Before joining Kistler, he was chief engineer for the Navy Air landing system at Textron. With this enormous background in both the mechanical and electrical world, he is heavily involved in solving our customers' measurement problems. And now you have to let me know how you can support these guys building the air taxis, mixing up the market these days, Bill. That stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, Pascal. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> as a, a bit of an overview to the uh, topic uh, that we're going to talk about today, Thought it'd be uh, interesting to sort of take a, a a brief survey to see what what might be uh, out in the uh, field already. You can see in terms of uh, EV tall suppliers, you certainly Kitty Hawk, Lilium, Whisk are very famous uh, famous companies uh, approaching uh, the problem from different uh, different aspects, of course. But I'd say for, uh, you know what you see in a common way is the use of of electric motors and rotors and 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 propellers. So this is basically the the heart of the 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 the, the, uh, the EV tolls, and certainly uh, the overall control and and operation is certainly you know the big task at hand for each one of these uh, these companies. So uh, certainly we're we're going to talk a little bit about how to uh, how to uh, you know test uh, electric motors, but also when you have an electric motor uh, coupled into an aircraft structure as well as having the propeller uh, rotating. You know, you get a certain amount of disturbances, and certainly some of these uh, 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 designs can be tilted. You know, there's a vectoring uh, aspect to it, so that also presents other uh, dynamics from a structural side. So, looking at uh, aspects of, say, uh, uh, forces and moments, uh, you know, reaction forces and moments uh, from a from a, uh, a motor assembly. Uh, could be uh, definitely a task at hand or even uh, vibration, you know, the re resident vibration in the structure due to various uh, conditions that might be, uh, you know, tested. So, so that's a little bit of a motivation there, but certainly with Lilium, you see uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're uh, EVTOL using uh, various uh, you know, approaches where either you're in cruise or transition or hovering. And obviously the, uh, the, the, uh, the rotor uh, changes uh, position to accommodate those uh, those scenarios. So that's that's quite common. And certainly with that change of, uh, of positioning, there's different uh, aerodynamic loads on the structure. And certainly there's, uh, and those are, are certainly uh, have to be also evaluated as well. Uh, in terms of uh, the news out in the industry, you see, uh, you know, recently or maybe over the last few months, you know, United and American have announced, you know, their entry into uh, purchasing, uh, you know, uh, you know, electric aircraft, uh, passenger aircraft, which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, cool uh, to see. Certainly, uh, companies like uh, Pepistro have already been uh, qualified as flight rated, but certainly there's going to be more, and more to follow. Uh, and and obviously the motivation here is, you know, just quiet uh, and clean, uh, operational, zero operational emissions. Uh, all the things we, we 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 are very sensitive to nowadays, you know, looking for green solutions and looking for you know being very friendly to the environment. So uh, anyway, that's uh, a little bit of background. So at least as far as the application goes, uh, obviously, you know, when you're when you're talking electric motor test, the first thing that comes to mind is, well, what do you do? You know, you're using uh, torque meters to assess, you know, uh, you know, various torque, velocity, speeds. And so forth uh, associated with that electric motor. 
So uh, that's a, that's the primary task at hand is to quantify that performance of the of, of the uh, of the electric motor. And certainly, you know, the re response is going to be based upon what kind of loads, aerodynamic loads, certainly temperatures, uh, you know, if you have vectoring of the propellers, certainly all the uh, dynamics of flight and, uh, and also operation in terms of wind and other turbulence and buffeting that might, might uh, very well occur. Also, as I mentioned, when you get into actually installing uh, such, uh, you know, uh, propulsion systems on aircraft, you now have to think about also, well, what's the, what's the interaction of that uh, propulsion concept with the structure, okay, with the aircraft? So, a lot of times uh, you're using a, uh, a force dynamometer, a uh, piezoelectric force dynamometer to actually measure the uh, imparted uh, forces and moments into the structure with various other various scenarios. Also, accelerometers are used quite often to quantify the vibration at, at the various uh, points, mounting points and uh, of the, of the uh, propulsion system as well as throughout the overall aircraft as well. So, uh, as far as measurements go, you know, we're, like I said, we're gonna you know, address torque, certainly from a standpoint of, of assessing, you know, the motor itself, but certainly from a, uh, looking at the application overall, we're looking at, you know, piezoelectric force, uh, multi-component force to quantify forces and moments, vibration for sure to uh, understand the, uh, the interactions of aerodynamic loads and, and the operation of the motor itself and propellers on the structure as well. And then lastly, uh, everything has to, you know, sort of, everything has to be recorded in a computer and analyzed. So this is a data acquisition systems task. So having the right signal conditioning to interface to, uh, to the various uh, instruments is critical. And uh, that uh, is something also we will talk about as well. So uh, as far as uh, methods of uh, motor torque measuring, I mean, there's several out there. The ones we're gonna focus on for sure are, are the piezo resist or the uh, strain gauge based technology, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, the torque meters and certainly piezoelectric in terms of say reaction torque uh, measurement. An example of a motor test stand is illustrated here where you see in the schematic here where you have the motor, you have al always when you have two shafts, you're gonna have uh, basically the need for couplings to uh, basically take out any uh, misalignments of those shafts. The torque sensor is uh, located between that and certainly the load and, and the unit under test, the motor. As far as the, the concept be behind the uh, torque sensors, I mean, nowadays, certainly you can always look for torque sensors with slip rings and that, but nowadays they're instrumented shafts with strain gauges and those, uh, and then that shaft is basically is an inductive coupling method to basically get uh, power in, signal out, and that is then uh, conditioned and then output onto the cable to the data acquisition system. So in terms of that, we talked a little bit about ro rotary uh, torque. Well, that's absolutely a strain gauge uh, based uh, measurement uh, where you have a, a rotor stator concept. And in this uh, illustration, you see basically exactly that where the, the rotor itself is actually instrumented with, uh, with strain gauges. The stator is uh, then picking up the signals and then outputting them to the, uh, uh, to the uh, interface electronics and then obviously to the data acquisition system. In terms of uh, torque sensors, there's a, a shaft uh, style and also a flange style. Flange styles tend to be very uh, you know, uh, thin in terms of uh, maybe a, an inch or two in terms of thickness. So for very tight, uh, you know, uh, measurement locations, it's uh, often uh, the, the, the preferred method. Uh, nowadays, these flange type methods have uh, basically also an inductive coupling to a, a rotor, and the rotor is maybe uh, located a, a millimeter or two away from the, uh, the, the, uh, the stator. And that way, uh, signals can be uh, transferred power and signals can be transferred and it's all uh, very well integrated and supported. Certainly in a lot of the uh, types of applications where you're trying to assess uh, you know, reaction uh, forces and, and torques on, on structures, piezoelectrics uh, are often used. There's certainly uh, sensors that are optimized just for measuring reaction torque, but others that are really optimized for measuring maybe torque and force 
FZ and MZ, or maybe all six components uh, that, uh, of measurement. So all those are very possible with piezoelectrics. Obviously, with piezoelectric technology, you know, it isn't. It is not a pure static, uh, you know, um, uh, technology like strain gauge. Uh, it's more optimized for dynamic. But what's cool about uh, the piezoelectric is that it is a uh, a quasi-static method, and with the right charge amps, you're able to measure, you know, over you know static uh, duration signals over you know say short periods of time, uh, you know, with very good accuracy. So there's a uh, there's definitely a, 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 an applic application segments that that apply to reaction torque as well. In terms of a comparison of piezoelectric and strain gauge, I would say the main comparison is you know strain gauge tends to be you know a fixed range or a fixed uh, you know a capacity, whereas with piezoelectric you have a lot of flexibility in 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 terms of ranging the uh, the measuring chain. So so uh, you know that's really important. Sometimes you. You, you often want you often have a budget constraint, so you know it's often good to have a, a sensor which can do many different tasks. And piezoelectrics often fall into that category. As I mentioned, piezoelectric is quasi-static versus strain gauge is pure, you know, static. Uh, one is optimized piezoelectric optimized for dynamic, where strain gauge can do both st static and a limited dynamic uh, performance range as well. Um, uh, with strain gauge also, you, you can compensate very nicely for, for temperature effects and, and so forth. So it's really quite a, a popular technology in a lot of applications nowadays, where piezoelectric also has its range of applications. In general, in aerospace, in my opinion, it's really the application determines what technology to use. And uh, it's often good to talk to your favorite uh, application engineer and get, bounce some, some ideas off and uh, try to find the best technology for that. In terms of uh, the piezoelectric, as I mentioned before, you know, we, we talked about rangeability. Well, with this type of technology I show here where you might even have a 10 kilonewton range sensor and you can range it down to one newton, for example, without any losing any resolution. Now that's pretty amazing and that's really a, a true feature of piezoelectric. Not only do you have the rangeability and not taking any penalty on, on resolution, but you also get the ability to actually tear your measuring chain uh, you know, uh, to get an electrical zero. Even if you might have 100 pounds acting on the sensor, you electrically get a zero out. So now you're only ranging on the dynamic or measurement portion of your test. So that gives you the ability to really optimize the dynamic range of your measuring chain for whatever test you're running. So it gives quite a bit of flexibility in that regard. Obviously with uh, sh shaft and flange torque meters, there's, uh, I mentioned before, there's actually thermal compensations going on, but also, you know, as speed increases, there's also, you know, uh, material ex expansion and other nonlinearities that, that, that affect the measurement. Now, you know, uh, sensor companies, uh, you know, like KISS or anyway, you know, would, would definitely compensate for that internally. So you're, you know, as you can see here, the green curve would be a, a resultant uh, compensated uh, response you know, with regard to those types of speed behavior uh, anomalies. Uh, so that's part of uh, designing instrument grade sensors. And certainly the same thing applies for angle and rotational speed uh, adjustments uh, where you're using maybe optical or magnetically based uh, uh, techniques, which might distort the, uh, the, uh, the actual measurements. Uh, and, you know, there's absolutely a compensation method there to, uh, to resolve uh, at accuracies up, upwards of 0.03 degrees uh, uh, resolution. As I mentioned, temperature is really inherent benefit of using strain gauge. You can easily, because it's looking at the change of resistance, you can easily use thermistors to, uh, to also uh, compensate for various uh, strain gauge uh, based implementations as well. In terms of uh, basics, uh, I mean, you know, the voltage output is is likely the, the most uh, popular one because it's can interface to nearly any data acquisition system nowadays. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, the wide bandwidth of, of strain gauge based torque meters is also quite impressive. A 10 kilohertz, you know, bandwidth is actually quite, uh, quite useful for a lot of applications. When you get into applications where you have a rotating, uh, you know, test article, okay, you have obviously, you know, several blades of the propeller and basically the rotating speed 
is, is sort of like a fundamental frequency. But as you have several different blades, there's actually, you actually get to multiply that fundamental frequency by the number of blades. That gives you really the true frequency rate of what you would expect. And then there's harmonics on top of that. So, so rotating equipment absolutely, you know, requires, uh, you know, attention to how much frequency you might really need. And, you know, torque meters, of course, need to be looked at in that regard based upon the application. Uh, obviously, frequency outputs are really quite popular where, you know, you can't really, uh, interference is really not affecting those signals and you really, really would need the right, you know, uh, 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 receiver to decode the, the frequency outputs and do, uh, you know, uh, measured information as well as digital outputs, whether it be RS-232, which is really a quite an old style format or some of the newer, you know, Profibus and Ethernet, EtherCAT, Ethernet IP uh, 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 um, uh, methods, which uh, which really support you know high data rates as well as uh, a lot of times you know even sometimes real time control if that were something needed. In terms of uh, the shaft torque meters and installation, I mean you know oftentimes the first decision is is really what do you need in terms of accuracy. I mean the accuracy class I show down here you know point two percent to 0.5 to 0.05 percent. So there's a, a definitely a wide range of accuracy. So that's one of the primary uh, selection criteria. Obviously, uh, calibration type measuring ranges, speed capabilities. Uh, and a lot of times you're able nowadays to get a dual range option where you might see, you know, in some cases there's a large startup torque. And then once the run, once it's through the starting run up torque, uh, startup torque, the running torque is actually quite quite low and, and moderate. So it gives you the ability then now to optimize your, your measuring range around that. Certainly, uh, you know, you, there's floating and fixed installations for shaft torque meters. We'll get into that a bit. You know, you have to look at the coupling and parasitic effects and certainly uh, over the test stand, any temperatures and are, are always gonna affect measurements. Temperature is usually the most uh, common error source in almost any measurement that I've taken over the years. Certainly, the, we talked a little about uh, uh, couplings in the past, uh, in the past few slides, but certainly there's different types of misalignment. You can see there's lateral misalignments uh, where, you know, affects radial forces. You get angular misalignments with uh, radial forces and bending torques and certainly ax axial misalignments that, uh, you know, uh, give uh, issues with axial forces. So it's very important to understand, you know, the types of of, of misalignments you might expect. So you can fit the, you know, correct, uh, you know, uh, uh, coupling in there. And what I wanna do is just show an example of, of what you what you might normally be faced with. In this case, we just picked a, a generic LPA 700 uh, coupling, and you can see there's a certain axial lateral and angular, uh, you know, uh, misalignment, allowable misalignments. And you can see here that from the calculation there, we can actually calculate the, Based upon the actual, uh, you know, or actual uh, misalignments, you can compute a percentage uh, based upon that ratio between the actual versus the uh, allowable. And as long as you're, you know, less than that 100%, it's a very much a usable solution for your application. <clears throat> Again, with uh, you know, installation of of. of uh, staff torque sensors, you have the, have the challenge of, uh, of high rotational speed sometimes and really requiring torsional stiffness to transmit, uh, you know, uh, torque. So in that regard, you have to, you know, have a suite of different uh, couplings, whether it be a double flex or single flex uh, couplings. These are all very, very much needed to, to solve the problem based upon your installation. An example here is one where you have a, 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 a half coupling based on a, a floating uh, torque meter uh, implementation. That's a fairly common installation and, and certainly with the uh, installation where you have a fixed uh, torque meter basically mounted to the base, you would need the, the full coupling or double flex couplings in order to uh, accommodate this, uh, this design. In terms of orientation with the uh, with the flexible or floating design, you can either go to a horizontal or vertical orientation of the of the torque uh, torque meter, and with a, a fixed one, it's typically limited to a horizontal, um, you know, installation. 
Again, with a typical uh, shaft torque sensor in this case here, you can see there's usually rated for the number uh, for the RPMs. Uh, scalability in terms of this, there's a dual range capability, certainly maximum speeds and temperature coefficients and accuracy class are all key selection criteria. So flange torque meters again, same basic uh, approach to selection. What is your accuracy class? What speeds? And you know, are you needing a dual range option? Are there cases where you have a maybe a higher start startup torque versus the running torque, or are there other scenarios which would support that? Would really determine the need for that. Again, the same rules basically apply in terms of the test stand and and installation in terms of. Uh, Overall, uh, you know, using the overall correct couplings and uh, uh, addressing uh, that in terms of uh, stiffness and uh, and and performance frequency wise. As far as these uh, flange torque sensors, I mean, there's uh, there's several uh, things you can look at for sure. You know, in terms of price, in terms of materials, you know, steel, titanium, aluminum. I mean, you can see that titanium is really famous for. You know, it's it's a uh, high stiffness and low mass, but it also generates a uh, a fairly high uh, high additional price. So, is that really needed? For example, you know, the addition uh, lower stiffness and fatigues. You know, how does that quantify into the uh, selection process? And you can see there's some sensitivity based upon materials as to which one you would go with. And certainly, reducing weight, aluminum is has the lowest weight density out of all three. And uh, that can also be a factor in terms of price as well. <clears throat> in, in terms of uh, the uh, flange torque sensors, what's critical here is really alignment to the rotor. As I mentioned before, there's, I'm sorry, the rotor is aligned to the stator, has to be centered, and certainly uh, it has to have a certain um, uh, separation, say one or one millimeter is very typical. There's usually tools nowadays that help you make that alignment. And certainly, if you're misaligned, the minute you start running a dry, basically a dry run without a, ro a load, you're going to see basically a sine wave in there, which should be a fairly fairly good indicator that you're you're off center or misaligned. So that has to be addressed before you could take any useful measurement. Uh, obviously, with the installation of flange torque sensors, we talked definitely with uh, using couplings, and with this case, you're using a single uh, uh, double flex coupling. Uh, with this installation, uh, and again, uh, the rule between flange and shaft sensors usually, for, you know, flange types are used for gearbox type applications, and uh, and you know, almost every other case possible is is really the shaft uh, uh, shaft type of uh, torque meter. And again, you know, looking at the uh, the flange torque meter again, we see the similar type uh, performance uh, criteria as the other one. As an example, see the 10 kilohertz response is uh, quite popular, and a lot of times in these types of implementations, you have a lot uh, more uh, buses or uh, uh, digital buses available uh, as options, and that also helps uh, in terms of uh, synchronizing uh, operation with a given uh, software or data acquisition system as well. In terms of uh, force and moment, I talked about piezoelectric before. Well, with piezoelectric force, uh, uh, with piezoelectric uh, measurement in terms of the reaction forces and moments, you typically will have multiple sensors. You know, usually three component sensors, which are arranged uh, in a top and bottom plate sandwich construction, and you're you're basically measuring the reaction forces and moments that are distributed amongst those sensors. Based upon that, you can compute. Uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the six components uh, based upon the geometry of the sensors, but fundamentally the same type of rules apply. By knowing the architecture of your of your of your piezoelectric dynamometer, you can now compute what the analog bandwidth uh, capabilities are, and does that match up with what you would expect? Obviously, if you have a, 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 a electric motor. Driving a a propeller and driving you know with loads on it, you're gonna and th this one here also is vectoring and changes its orientation. You're gonna have different loads on the structure. Those can be easily characterized by uh, such a system in, in terms of six components. Uh, a lot of times with these uh, systems, you're looking at uh, there are spring mass systems, the force dynamometers, and with that regard, mass will affect the natural frequencies. 
Uh, the six component measurement, as I show here in the lower left hand corner, basically with the, uh, with an, a separation between the center of the sensor to the. Uh, vertical or to the center of the dynamometer a would be the vertical separation B would be the horizontal separation to the center. You can basically write the closed form expressions, which help you derive the 6 components directly. Um, obviously, mounting is always critical to get the best frequency performance. You want to have a, a very rigid mount, multiple fasteners, and certainly with PE dynamometers, as I said before, they're uh, extremely uh, robust. They uh, basically have over, a lot of overrange capability. They're rangeable, uh, you know, high, uh, high signal to noise ratio, low noise, and high, uh, generally high natural frequencies. So they complement uh, this type of measurement quite well. This is an application I did over at, uh, or we did over at Caltech, uh, you know, at, you know, at the CAST, uh, Syst uh, CAST uh, department, the Center for Autonomous Systems and Technologies, where they use one of these piezoelectric dynamometers, and they're doing a lot of work with, uh, with uh, autonomous vehicles, robotics, drones, eVTOLs, scale models, and they've got a wind, uh, basically a distributed wind, uh, wind wall, if you will, where they can uh, basically uh, take the, the, uh, the model and fly it, and then uh, measure the forces and moments acting upon. Uh, the air structure by using this force dynamometer. Uh, what they found was that actually the comparison of the results to previous results using the piezoelectric uh, dynamometer were quite accurate, you know, in terms of lift and drag and so forth. So it was really a, a good candidate for for uh, making such tests. And certainly, you know, this is a full scale model test where the full uh, EV taller model uh, uh, drone is uh, attached to the dynamometer. In other cases, you might have just certainly the, the propulsion system, you know, the motor and propeller assembly, say, attached through some structure to the dynamometer itself, uh, allowing you to measure the reaction forces and moments under various conditions. Uh, as far as building your own force dynamometer, that's often done in the industry. It's, it does take some, some rules. So I'll just go through them quickly. It takes a, a certain uh, skill in terms of uh, making sure you're parallel and flat between these two top and bottom plates, making sure that you preload uh, sensors adequately to get, uh, you know, tensile and compressive uh, measurement, uh, linearity, and certainly a good shear force handling capability. A highly preloaded or well preloaded sensor is going to have the best linearity, and linearity is often one of the biggest error sources in any force measurement. Obviously, temperature is probably the biggest, but you, you want to definitely uh, take care on, on preloading for the best linearity. With preloading, you also have uh, shunt force uh, losses due to uh, you know, the, the actual preload bolt taking up some of the force. Those are pretty much in that 5 to 9% range, and they're very much calibrated out of uh, and in terms of the actual sensitivities. By preloading as well, you get the compressive and tensile force handling. And again, this allows you to, to uh, measure all kinds of uh, uh, dynamics associated with your uh, test article. <clears throat> In any installation of, of these uh, multi-component force sensors, you want to always make sure alignment is there. Every one degree misalignment in X and Y could be a, a 2% crosstalk <clears throat> between X and Y. So we designed sensors with with flats on each side so we can align these with <coughs> with straight edges and it really makes for a, a really high performance low cross talk solution just a <coughs> just an example of, of what you might see is in a data sheet you might see a cross talks upwards of say 3% on how x and y uh, affect z and but in calibration you can see <coughs> cross talks are generally in the uh, you know, less than, uh, well, well, less than 1%. In fact, in this case, it was almost, it was 0%. That was on a cal cert. So oftentimes uh, the actual calibrated uh, uh, crosstalks are far better <coughs> than the general data sheet values. Um, in terms of uh, torque and force calibration, I mean, <coughs> uh, strain gauge uh, rotary torque sensors are calibrated uh, piecewise where piezoelectrics are are uh, uh, calibrated in a continuous fashion as shown in these illustrations. Uh, basically, both techniques are quite accurate and it's just a matter of the, you know, the basic technology requires a, a different method. 
In terms of accelerometers, I talked previously about when you have now uh, electric motors coupled to a structure where you have a propeller rotating, you've got certain uh, rotating speeds, you've got certain uh, 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 number of propeller blades, you've got now the dynamics of, of aerodynamics uh, affecting the structure. Uh, and now you want to figure out, hey, how is uh, the vibration around, uh, you know, these uh, mounting points of the uh, propulsion system? <clears throat> anyway, accelerometers are more commonly used. Now, in flight test, it's very important to understand flight test usually means that you're, 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 you're on the ground at some time and you're up at altitude sometime. And, you know, when you're up at altitude, oftentimes those temperatures are much colder. When you're on the ground, those temperatures tend to be much warmer, depending on which part of the country you're in. Certainly, if you're at Edwards Air Force Base, and you know, you're going to probably see, you know, hotter temperatures. Anyway, uh, there's certain materials used in accelerometers, which really dictate what might be the best choice for the lowest uh, error sources in your measurement. <clears throat> what we found is there's three basic materials that are used for accelerometers. There's a, there's a, a piezo ceramics, there's quartz material. These are all been used for a long time, and there's a new material, you know, uh, you know, proprietary to Kistler called piezo star. Well, the blue curve, uh, what this curve is showing is really the sensitivity deviation is the vertical axis over temperature. So you can see piezo ceramics are actually have a very high, uh, you know, uh, sensitivity to temperature because they're pyroelectric by design. And we, we absolutely expect to see high, high uh, deviations like this with this technology where quartz is much better behaved. And that's, again, is very much expected. But with piezo star, you see near zero uh, deviation with temperature over a fairly wide frequency band of uh, maybe a couple hundred degrees Celsius would be uh, fairly common. So to take away any temperature errors into your measurement, it's really important you select the accelerometer appropriately. What is it a piezoelectric or is it a different technology? What materials are, are used and what is the ultimate temperature response? Every sensor, no matter what sensor it is, will have different sensitivities or influences uh, to mounting, to temperature, to humidity, electromagnetic fields. So all of these are, are pretty specific, but a lot of times suppliers will quantify in their data sheet those sensitivities. So it's up to the user to say, okay, in my application, I've got these conditions and then apply those conditions to say how a manufacturer rates a, a given sensor. And then you can come out with say an error budget as to what you would expect nominally, you know, in terms of accuracy uh, of, of that sensor. So that would be normally how this is used. And certainly I talked a little about piezoelectric or uh, accelerometers, which are I'll say more commonly used, but, you know, for fixed body uh, uh, motion, uh, rigid body motion, you know, MEMS capacitive accelerometers are also used because they're, they not only give you the high frequency, but they give you static uh, frequency response as well. So you can clearly measure any low frequency uh, rigid body motion, uh, you know, of the air structure uh, with these types of accelerometers. And of course, with uh, piezoelectrics, it's also widely used where you see uh, high resonant frequencies. You see bandwidths up upwards of uh, you know 20 kilohertz at times, 10 percent, which gives a real chance to really measure if you really got high RPMs of the of a prop shaft and you've got multiple blades. It might allow you to really uh, really uh, you know measure uh, the various uh, resonant frequencies and the harmonics of those those uh, those op of that operation. As far as signal conditioning goes, I mean, uh, there's always uh, how, any signal conditioning usually imparts some noise into a, a measurement. Obviously, the sensor itself is going to have some noise. So every component in your measuring chain is going to contribute. So if you have a sensor, you might have a signal conditioner and even data acquisition. Each one will contribute to a, to a noise profile. So basically what, what goes on is that, you know, a lot of times you can quantify noise in terms of what's called a noise power spectral density, and that gives you uh, a, a feeling for you know, noise level as a function of frequency, which is very useful because sometimes you might not be interested in certain frequency range. It might be, uh, you know, maybe 100 hertz to 300 hertz might be the range of interest. What you see here is a lot of times noise power spectral densities act in a one over F characteristic where you have higher noise power 
at the lower frequencies. As you get out in frequency, you see a reduction of noise power with frequencies, and that tends to be very complementary to measuring lower lower overall noise uh, in your measurement if you're looking at higher uh, bandwidth, say. Time frequency domain, when you're doing signal conditioning and when you're doing this type of analysis, understanding the time frequency domain is always very important and, and understanding sample rates. A lot of times people might get confused. You know, like when you're talking, <clears throat> there's, there's, there's analog bandwidth required for your measurement. That's always, that should always be determined up front. You know, what is your RPM? How many, you know, pro uh, propeller blades are there? You know, what type of harmonics do you want to consider in your measurement? That should tell you, hey, I need a kilohertz of bandwidth, analog bandwidth to measure what I need, for example. So how do you then determine the, the sample rate? The sample rate is always in terms of samples per second. And that way you always get the separation between hertz in bandwidth and samples per second in sample rate. So it keeps everything sort of separated and clean. The general rule I use from a practical side is always sample 10 times the bandwidth. Uh, so if you had a one kilohertz uh, bandwidth requirement, you would then sample at 10 kilosamples per second would be uh, the rule. Obviously, sample rate is one of the conditions, but there's always resolution. Well, back in the day, the old days, you know, people were very happy to get eight bits or some ridiculous, uh, you know, low resolution. And nowadays, 24 bits uh, is very, very common in the industry. And uh, what that means is you've got well over 100 dB dynamic range, or roughly 6 dB per bit. And you can easily, that usually well exceeds any anything a sensor can do. Most sensors, I mean, if you get a sensor that can measure 90 dB dynamic range, you've got a pretty pretty high fidelity sensor. Uh, and usually 16 bits is more than enough. But anyway, nowadays, 24 bits is there. So not only do you wrestle with sample rate, that's very important, but the number of bits, that's usually nowadays 16 or 24 would be probably what you'd find. Um, when you sample as well, there's something called aliasing, and that's why there's always a condition of you've got to be at least two times the, 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 the signal bandwidth to, to, to make sure that you don't get uh, secondary effects into your signal by virtue of what's called aliasing. Basically, what aliasing does, it, it basically takes high frequencies of, of, the, of the measurement and folds them back into looking like lower frequencies, and it sort of fakes you out. So you really got to make sure that you've got a uh, a signal processing system that that uh, clearly identifies bandwidth, clearly identifies uh, 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 an anti-aliasing filter and a sample rate. <clears throat> and again, signal signal conditioning filters are always widely used. My general recommendation for filtering is try not to use it when you're taking measurements. Uh, it's it's often best if you can take them wide open without any filtering whatsoever in the analog world, right? And that, the reason for that is that you're digitizing now and you, there's all kinds of power, powerful software out nowadays that can easily you know, take that raw data and, and, and filter it digitally. So uh, from my perspective, that gives you the, the best chance of not distorting any signals because when you filter, you can very well uh, distort the, the desired signal. And that's could be actually quite bad. You could actually attenuate what you're trying to measure. So it's often good to measure it wide open and then uh, simply uh, do your analysis and software and using uh, various filter concepts there. You know, nowadays, uh, you know, manufacturers and, you know, Kisser's no different. We're trying to get really innovative and, you know, you're trying to, you know, build in data acquisition and to say it's already, you know, quality signal conditioners. Well, nowadays, you know, getting integrated signal conditioning and data acquisition is sort of like very commonly available. But what's really unique about what's called a lab amp is that it actually does it for piezoelectric signals. And what it does, it allows you to get all the range ability that we talked about, but also the ability to now sample at 24 bits, uh, up to 200 kilosamples per second, all synchronized, you know, within better than one microsecond 
<clears throat> and having uh, very low noise on top. So, again, when you're looking at, at signal conditioning and data acquisition, keep in mind that, that everything contributes to, to, a, to a, a noise and, and to an error. Your sensor, your signal conditioner, and data acquisition system. So, again, talking to your favorite application engineer often can save you a lot of time, and uh, I strongly recommend you, sometimes a five minute conversation with your favorite application engineer could save you hours of time and maybe you know, making a measurement wrong and having to redo it, which is always hard to explain to our bosses, you know? So they're always asking us questions. So yeah, feel free to contact uh, your, your favorite uh, person on the application side. Uh, measuring chains, we went through a lot, we covered a lot of ground, okay? So basically the takeaway is, look, there's sensor selection criteria, that absolutely is tied to the application. There's no doubt. So intimate knowledge of your application, what you're looking for, and you know, making sure that you've you've adequately <clears throat> sized the uh, the requirements so that you could pick the right sensor is rather critical. Okay. In electric motor testing and in EV tools, <clears throat> there's definitely, you know, on the bench, you're going to be doing motor test in a conventional torque meter setup with a load and a and a motor and couplings and so forth. In the actual application, you're going to have absolutely have uh, an electric motor propulsion system coupled into the structure of the aircraft, now with rotating propellers, now with generated a certain RPM and harmonics, and all that stuff now you know, has to be evaluated from a structural side as well. How does the structure respond to the reaction forces and torques? How does the vibration affect the overall structure as well? Does that all meet the requirements? So a lot of detail there, but certainly, again, favorite application engineer often could guide you the best in the best way. With Kistler, and this is probably the only commercial you'll you'll find on on this this uh, this uh, uh, WebEx webinar, is really uh, is really experts that can make uh, test stands uh, based upon requirements. And this is again the only commercial you're going to hear. And I would just encourage you, if you've got very difficult test stand requirements, you know, please give it a consideration because it's a, uh, you know, when I look at the complexity and 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 the detail, it's uh, really second to no, none. It's uh, really quite impressive. So I would just say keep that in mind. Uh, obviously, with any test stand, you might want to integrate in all kinds of different sensors. And again, that's very easy to do when you have you know, a, a, a high base capability uh, already existing. So you can get accelerometers, temperature, you know, uh, uh, torque, speed, all the various uh, parameters that are of interest in a EV tall type uh, uh, test. And again, with these types of systems, having the right dashboard, what are the key parameters? How do, do they need to be displayed? How do you quantify operation and how does, how does it look and how do you, you know, do a pass fail test uh, and collect data? So this is all done by the dashboard and that certainly can be customized as well. Lastly, in summary, I just wanna say that, uh, that, you know, it's pretty exciting, I guess, looking at, you know, the world and saying, wow, look at all the, all the you know, man-made fuels being used to you know, run aircraft and it's, it's been that way for all kinds of years, okay? Nowadays, we see the major airlines you know, investing in aircraft that are electric, electrical. We see innovative and, and, and really strong entrepreneurial companies developing new methods that people need, air taxis and so forth to get from point A to point B and very, busy metropolitan areas. I mean, these are all things we need and they're all good for the environment. It's pretty exciting when we look at it. Yes, there's a lot of sensors that you can use to quantify this. Yes, there's a lot of uh, detail involved, but I think what we wanted to do with this presentation was really just give you an awareness of those things which would you need to consider and certainly always consult your favorite application engineer. Those folks uh, really earn their money and they, they wanna absolutely provide options and discussion on a high technical level to complement your needs. On that point, I'd like to you know, throw it back to Pascal. And uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, many thanks for this comprehensive overview, Bill. So I really learned a lot and it seems that also the attendees were really uh, in, we got so many questions. Wow. Just 
highlight some of them <laughs> and address them to you. So Great. I know you already um, touched this, um, let's say this um, question a little bit, but maybe you can highlight a little bit more, uh, maybe also for dynamometer when it comes to temperature. So this guy want to know, can all of your sensors be used at temperature and what are the general limits to temperature? So really good question, actually. Uh, with force, piezoelectric force dynamometers, they absolutely have a wide temperature range of operations, say zero degrees C on up to maybe 80 would be very typical, um, you know, sometimes on the low end as well. The key to dynamometers, and, and again, we'd have to look at each sensor implementation. The key to dynamometers and temperature is that temperature variations can affect performance because, uh, you know, constant temperatures you know, absolutely can be uh, dealt with. But time varying and uh, dynamic temperatures sometimes can create, uh, you know, unwanted uh, type response. So I would say, you know, from a constant temperature perspective, if you're able to to make a test in, in a certain environment, that would be absolutely cool. If you're looking at quasi-static, I would say it's more, temperature is more critical, dynamic temperature. If you're looking at a, uh, a dynamic frequency measurement, say from one hertz or two hertz on up, typically temperature variations don't hurt you as much in a piezoelectric force installation. So, so when you're talking to your favorite application engineer, bring up things like, hey, I got this type of frequency requirement, and these are the things that uh, that that I would like to measure, and then we could actually look at a specific sensor, a specific implementation. And maybe you want to fly it. Those are all things we can we can address on a one to one basis, and we'd love to do that. So, uh, you know, I'm sure my information is available, uh, you know, or we can supply it to you. Just uh, let Pascal know uh, uh, your your contact information, and we could talk directly to uh, work through the detail. Cool. <clears throat> Yeah, you already introduced the next question or um, topic. So that's uh, natural frequency. So what is a typical natural frequency of a dynamometer? Well, that's a really good question. Okay, so, you know, typically with force sensors, okay, it, it all relies upon, you know, the size and mass acting upon the force sensor. Like we showed, it's all a spring mass system. So, but I will say practically speaking, uh, dynamometers from maybe uh, a few inches, in, you know, to maybe 16 inches. You might see, uh, you know, say in the three to four kilohertz range on up uh, down as dynamometers get big, it might be a couple kilohertz in terms of uh, natural frequency. So, so again, with with force measurement, you you don't get the benefits of of what an accelerometer would do, but with an accelerometer you don't get the benefits of a force sensor would do. Now, certainly F equals MA everywhere in the world, I'm pretty sure of that. But, you know, understanding what M is isn't as easy as, as it might appear. So measuring force directly is often very desired. So, so I guess the, the, the short answer is, is that generally, you know, you, we're all used to accelerometers measuring 10 kilohertz. That's like a, a, a no brainer. But with force sensors, you're usually in that you know, two to three, four kilohertz range natural frequency, you know, and it might be higher. If you told me it was only an inch square or a couple inches square, I, I'd tell you, yeah, we can do even better than that. So again, talk to your favorite application engineer. And again, I'm happy to address your specific application. If you just send me a mail, we, we can get into any level of detail that you would like. Many thanks for that one. <clears throat> Not a um, question was about electric engines and the magnetic field. So, what's the influence on <clears throat> on your sensors, some Kistler sensors, um, or also um, having um, other manufacturers in there, and how to shield them? Yeah, um, generally speaking, I mean, uh, at this time, we don't have a spec for electromagnetic influence to the to the sensor. The general the general approach to uh, using sensors in an electromagnetic environment is, is simply, if you use materials that are non-magnetic, you generally get a low magnetic uh, response. So I would say in general, Kistler falls into that category. Obviously we'd have to look at each sensor, but, but that's generally what you do. Now to shield, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as far as a sensor goes, you know, this is, uh, 
this is probably going to require some sort of, a, uh, I'll say, a screening uh, where you have, you know, maybe a metal uh, housing around it. Uh, you know, maybe it's lightweight, maybe it's, it's screening, uh, our conventional screening. So there are ways you can use a, a, a metal screen on the sensor, say, and tie it to a ground. Could mitigate some of that, but I'll tell you, in my experience, electromagnetic uh, you know, interference is not something you can easily generalize on. And the reason is, is that almost everything is, you know, can be susceptible. Like, for instance, if you just understand the basic physics that we learned in, you know, Grammar school, where you know basically, if you have a very magnetic field in a in a, in a cable, you're going to generate current. So, I mean, that doesn't change, right? That's going to always be present. So, how well does the manufacturer shield the cable? You know, that's often the question. Well, in my experience, it's really a measurement that does that. Or you say, hey, look, I need to operate in this type of environment, and the manufacturer says, hey, look, we can go away and and get you an answer on that. And, and that's always cool. You know, a lot of times, like I say, manufacturers aren't having exact uh, specs in their data sheet, but maybe they've taken some measurements and they can provide <clears throat> guidance and recommendations that you can uh, use. So, yeah, <clears throat> it's for sure um, uh, a good question. And uh, and, and every man, you know, uh, Kissler has definitely addressed that with some uh, customers. So I would just say, let's, uh, let's discuss your application in more detail and we can definitely, uh, uh, answer that for your application if, if need be. Good. Many thanks for that one. So we co <clears throat> we covered all the topics now, and I would like to to thank you, Bill. It was a pleasure to host you, and I, I enjoyed it a lot. So um, now it's it's my turn to to wish you a beautiful day. And once more, do not hesitate if um, you have any questions to reach out to Bill or to your favorite application engineer. And then I wish you all the best and see you soon. Bye-bye, yeah. guys. Bye-bye.